glorious gamers out there, welcome to the Players 2 podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever, it all helps us out. It all does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And while you're over there, if you leave us a little review, let us know and we'll give you a shout out on social media. It really does mean a huge amount to us. And thank you so very much to anyone that's already done that for us. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me, as always, but in a cupboard under the stairs still, is Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? <laughs> it's going well, Mark. Yeah, I am still in my very spacious cupboard uh, here in my flat. We are still <laughs> in lockdown here in the UK, so this is the this is my life now. This is my future, living in the cupboard next to a pushy old mattress and some old <laughs> junk that we didn't bother getting rid of, basically. <laughs> Good um, lord. How are you doing, Mark? <laughs> I have been working like a man Maniac Lewis for mm. I think seven days in a row now over the weekend and everything. Yeah, it's, it's been a rough one in work. We are real people who have real jobs as well as doing this podcast, ladies and gentlemen. And good lord, was mine a nightmare this week. I am over the worst of it, thankfully. I'm not going to lie to you, the recording of this podcast was in jeopardy for quite a long period of time, but we have managed to record. So Lewis, forgetting that nightmare, onto the video games, what have you been playing? Well Mark, I have finally, finally, finally finished Outer Wilds, um, which I have been playing on and yes, off man. for quite a long time now. Yeah, like I'm, six months? Holy well, shit, man, I, I, it's been I a long it, time you've been playing that. I haven't double checked, I think it came out on PlayStation back in October maybe, and I got it more or less then. So as I've said a, a few times before, I'm playing it with my flatmate, so we, I don't play it regularly. It's like a game that we drop in and out of maybe once a week, or now that we're in lockdown, very frequently because there's not a lot else going on so I finished it just a few days back we basically had just the last puzzle to do and that was actually quite tricky to, to actually finish the game it makes you do some stuff that ordinarily the game hasn't really asked you to do um, which was nice it was a nice way to wind everything up and the actual ending I won't say anything remotely spoilery about it but the actual ending of the game the how the last maybe sort of 40 minutes or so play out is just utterly astonishing heartbreaking moving incredible incredible stuff I was so so pleased with how it came together at the end this kind of statement it tried to make yeah just absolutely brilliant I won't go on and on about it because I've talked about this game for months as I've said but this is just an utterly astonishing game about exploration and about learning and about figuring out what is happening in this small universe and why it's happening and putting every little piece of your knowledge together to kind of unravel the whole mystery that's at the heart of the game or several mysteries that are at the heart of the game particularly at this time when things are a bit stressy and stuff but just generally always I I think that in a game that is such a such an interesting thing such a profound thing to do and the fact that it sort of replaces what people normally expect to happen in games which is that you develop skills or you unlock skills even and you go around putting those skills into action this game sort of replaces the notion of skill with learning or with knowledge you go to each planet and you uncover a little piece of something and you take that knowledge and you think where else does that knowledge fit? What else have I done where that might come in handy? And you go and you take it there and you unlock another thing. And it's just so profound. It's so, so enjoyable to play. It's revelatory when you get certain pieces of the puzzle correct and you can move on and find the next bit. I'm literally going to say nothing. I won't tell you anything about the topology or the geography of the universe that you're in or anything because it's all, I mean, a lot of it you'll have seen if you've looked up the game at all, but it's all worth experiencing for the first time and having those repeated encounters with this universe that you're in. I really, I cannot recommend it enough. I'm so pleased to be finished with it, but at the same time, it's the kind of game that you could just spend a long, long time in. So very pleased to finally be done with it. Nice one, man. That sounds fucking awesome. You said on our Twitter this week that you thought it was one of your favourite games ever now as well, which is high praise indeed. Yeah, I would definitely put it there. It's, it just it elevates itself, it, particularly once you get to the end of it and you see that the way that it finally unravels. It's unlike anything I've played, and it's I know that's a phrase that we probably use too much and a lot of people use too much, right? But yeah, <laughs> and it's a phrase that you've seen a lot in games, and it you know this ending it isn't necessarily unexpected, but it's just it's quiet and brilliant and feels completely sensible to what else is happening in the game. In the immediate aftermath of that, I sat there and I thought this is one of the best things I've ever played. I still think it sits up there. You know that 
minutes with most of a week gone by since to kind of let it percolate in my mind everything it does I mean it's it's definitely got errors it's definitely got some flaws in it there's some gameplay elements where you can tell that the fact that it was released first on PC is kind of important because some of the controls are very loose again not spoiler at all some of the places you have to control things using a little ball and just the control of the little ball is just pretty hard to do on joysticks and there's so there's wee things like that that you know I would never say anything is a perfect game but this comes close to it for me in terms of the way that narrative comes together with world building with the design of the universe that you're in with the challenges that it puts in with the way it makes you think as a player nothing is explained to you beyond you know the facts of this universe but how you do them and where you're supposed to go and all of that sort of stuff is just there for you to explore and fail and fail better and try again and just because of that it's one of these games that has just absolutely stuck with me since I started playing it and now that I've finished playing it it's still all the more so I honestly could not recommend it enough some people won't like it it will not be for everyone for sure but it's I think it's definitely worth seeing even if you end up not getting all the way through it you know nice one man that sounds very very awesome I'll definitely need to get around to playing it at some point uh, it's definitely on my list of games to play during the quarantine um, if I can <laughs> get around to them <laughs> <laughs> what have you been playing during your quarantine this week? Well, not very much, unfortunately, due to my aforementioned terrible, terrible, awful work situation. But just a bit more Doom Eternal, man. And it's just so good. It's great. It's just such a release of of what I've been feeling recently, which is a lot of stress. <laughs> And just, again, just shooting those demons in the face is just really, really, really great. It's just really cathartic and just good, meaningless fun, you know? I mean, it just, it doesn't take a lot of effort. I mean, although some sections of it are still quite hard, but it makes you feel great. It makes you feel very, very powerful, as as did Doom 2016. And I'm just continuing to love it. I've really not progressed the story much more at all since the How would you since know? the last time we spoke <laughs> well there there are story beats here and there i know we make fun of the fact that it doesn't really have a story but there are story beats here and there and i do understand sort of what i'm supposed to be doing now because the game initially just kind of drops you in you're now on earth and not on mars as you were in the previous game and you just kind of dropped in and it's just like yep on you go kill the demons uh, so, so that's what i've done it was great <laughs> yeah so so Perfect. not not a huge amount from me but i'm definitely hoping that this week i'll be able to play a hell of a lot more doom eternal because i am absolutely gasping to play more of it it is so good i'm not sure that there's better gunplay in any fps I, i'm really not sure that there is because it is so fucking good it is so so fun that's such a massive, massive thing for, particularly for you to say to me, because a lot of your gaming history is with FPSs, like particularly Call of Duty, obviously. Yeah, I know, I know, but it's just, it's a different, it's a totally different flavour. Mm. It just feels so different to those things. Like, military shooters like Call of Duty and whatever feel a certain way and are going for a certain sense of realism. Doom is not doing any of that. Doom's whole thing is, how can we make this as fun as possible? Do you know what I mean? How can we make this as crazy and as fast-paced and as intense as possible at every single given moment? As I said last week, the solution to any problem Doom puts in front of you is never hide. It's always just shoot it faster or dodge better or, I don't know, use four grenades. It's <laughs> it's always keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. It's never stop and hide and assess. It's always, this is a dynamic situation. You need to respond to it immediately. And the pace with which it's played really helps with that as well. Like your actual movement speed, your actual character movement speed is bizarre <laughs> how, fa- how <laughs> fast that is. And the gunplay, you never have to reload. It's just stuff like that that they've just decided, no, we're just, we're stripping all this back. We're focusing on making it as fun as possible. We're making it as fun for the player to play. And they've knocked out the fucking park because it is brilliant. It is absolutely great. And even as someone who doesn't particularly like FPSs, and I know that you don't, mm. I would be really interested for you to like play it for an extended period of time and just see how you think that it is. Yeah. Because to me to me it feels amazing, but I play a lot of FPSs or I have played a lot of FPSs or shooters in general in my gaming life, whereas you really haven't. So it might just feel like any other shooter to you. But to me it feels like totally different. It yeah. Feels completely different. Well, from what I played the Doom 2016, which wasn't a lot, but played it a little bit with you, um, I, I felt it within that game even, you know, not, maybe not so much the the ins and outs of how the shooting necessarily feels, but the way it makes you approach all of that, I totally agree with you. Like, it feels much more reactive to your environment and much, at, at once much more tactical and much less tactical than certain other shooters are. You know, it's, it's almost like a puzzle game, it felt to me at times, Doom 2016 this is, and I wonder if that is kind of what they're going yeah, for again here. That, you know? that totally, totally makes sense, man. It totally makes 
makes sense. And I, I know that other people have said that before. It's always like, right, okay, so we know that these guys are coming and then we have to deal with those guys before we can deal with these guys. And to do that, we're best placed here. And then to do that, then we have to move around to here. And you can't ever stop as yeah. well because stopping in Doom is death. Stopping <laughs> means death. So you cannot stop and hide. You have to be constantly, constantly, constantly moving. Yeah, it's, it's just great. It's just really, 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 really great fun. And I really want to get tour into it for like a huge session, which I've not really been able to do yet. W- once I do that, I'm absolutely convinced that I'm just going to totally fall in love with this. <laughs> <laughs> I really am. I really Good am. stuff. Good stuff. Nice. Anyway, Lewis, it is now time for the news. All right, and news item number one. Nintendo have dropped a surprise direct mini Lewis on the Thursday our previous podcast came out, which is very, very upsetting to me that Nintendo keep doing this. I don't know what is so special about Thursdays. <laughs> anyway, we're not we're not going to run down every single thing that was in the direct. It was actually an all right direct, and we'll post links to it over in the show notes at players2.com. But some of the highlights were, well, one, 2K announced that a whole host of games of theirs are going to be coming onto the Switch, um, including the Bioshock collection, the Borderlands Legendary collection, and the XCOM 2 collection, which are all coming to Switch on May the 29th. This feels like a really good offer from 2K for Switch players. I mean, most of these games are available pretty easily elsewhere now. Certainly the Bioshock collection's been out on, on Xbox and PlayStation for quite a while. The one that stuck out to me within all of that was XCOM 2, though. That Damn feels to right, me, man. That stuck out to me as well. I mean, that is a, an absolutely brilliant game anyway, and to get all the kind of DLC and stuff packaged in with that is one thing but just that type of game on the switch on the switch is that's what it's 100 100 yeah as much as i'm dying to go back and play some of the old bioshock games i haven't played the first two i fully intend on doing that but on playstation but there's some idea there about playing xcom on the switch moving between portable and docked not that we're too portable anymore i suppose but um (laughs) but you know that those kind of the lengths of those matches and the way that that game unfolds it feels like an almost perfect there's just not enough like tactical strategy games on the switch or not as many of the really big ones as you you know people might want to play there so this is a really great offer from 2k for switch players and it's all coming at the same time on may 29th which is really cool the next highlight from the switch was for me anyway was the bravely default 2 demo that is now currently available i have not had the chance to play this because i've had the chance to play basically nothing once again work is a nightmare however i i thought the game looked really really great and as i was saying to you off air i was going to play trials of mana perhaps at some point this year but in actual fact i've got that completely wrong because it wasn't trials of mana at all that i wanted to play it was bravely default that i wanted to play i've completely got these two games mixed up in my head But in my defense, they are both Final Fantasy spinoffs, but Octopath Traveler, which I played in 2018, which was one of my favorite games that year, was actually spun off again from Bravely Default. So I was really, really interested in playing it. And I thought that the the gameplay that they showed off there was was really good, was really interesting. And it's really awesome that they've dropped a demo. We're all about demos here. Demos are awesome. (laughs) Okay, that's enough of the JRPGs before Lewis's eyes glaze I'm, over. I'm falling asleep in my cupboard here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Just on that, by the way, I, I did think the Bravely Default 2 stuff was quite interesting looking. I knew it would be something that took your fancy. Um, and I've heard that the demo is really strangely difficult. So one to look out for when you get some time for it this week. Oh, that's interesting, man. I, I didn't know that about the demo. I'm kind of trying to be uh, steering clear of it. But yeah, I'm definitely going to jump in at some point. The next one up was Burnout Paradise Remastered, which is coming to Switch this year. Now, Burnout Paradise is one of the best racing games ever made, as far as I'm concerned. It is absolutely superb. It was the first game to really do an open world driving game, which is now, of course, commonplace in most driving games. Really superb that that's coming to coming to Switch. And probably one of the highlights for a lot of people would have been that the new Smash DLC character was unveiled and that it would be someone from ARMS, which would probably have been slightly disappointing, I would reckon, for most people. (laughs) But it almost seems inevitable that being a Nintendo franchise as it is, it would kind of make sense for them to be there almost. Yeah. It was like another Nintendo fighting game. I I don't know how you feel about that. But particularly that it's a a fighting game. It does, it struck me as soon as I saw this announcement, I was like, oh yeah, how come there wasn't an ARMS character in Smash Ultimate anyway? But yeah, it's not particularly exciting if you're you're not into ARMS, which I don't imagine too many people are. No, Um, I don't think too many people are. (laughs) No. uh, I think the actual announcement of which character from ARMS it's going to be is coming in June uh, and they'll 
reveal everything at that point. So that's oh, know, okay. something cool. to look forward to. Cool, cool. Just, a, just another couple of honourable mentions from the Direct. There was more information about the Pokemon expansion pass that was coming out later this year. There was more information about the Animal Crossing Easter event, which is actually currently happening. Uh, as we record this, we're recording this on April Fool's Day. Also coming to the Switch is Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy, which is available right now. Star Wars Episode 1 Racer, which was a very popular racing game and probably the best thing to come out of Star Wars Episode 1, <laughs> um, is also coming to the Switch later this year. Catherine Fullbody is coming to the Switch in July. Panzer Dragoon Remake also shadow dropped that day for the Switch. And Minecraft Dungeons, it was announced that it was coming in, quotes, spring, but it has subsequently been confirmed that it is coming on May the 26th, which is actually a bit of a delay because it was supposed to be coming out this month. And they opened the whole direct with the Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Um, then they have a new trailer for that, and I think that there's some sort of extension to the original Xenoblade Chronicles that is going on there, and that's coming out on May the 29th, so if you're interested in that, go and check it out. Now, Lewis, there was nothing on Breath of the Wild sequel or nothing on Metroid and nothing about any of the big games. So this, I suppose, <laughs> is why it was a mini direct. However, news item number two, there has been a massive amount of leaks that suggest that Nintendo are planning to release a whole host of new and remastered Mario games this year. This is to mark the 35th anniversary of the Super Mario series. Uh, the leaks have all but been confirmed. They've been confirmed by Eurogamer, VGC, uh, Gamatsu, VentureBeat. have all had a whole host of articles out about these leaks. The remakes will apparently include Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine and Super Mario Galaxy. There will also be a deluxe version of the Super Mario 3D World, which was the one that was out on the Wii U. And there will be a new Paper Mario game as well, uh, which is a rumour that we've also heard before. And as I said, all of this is apparently coming this year, which is fucking awesome. And probably worth noting as well that this announcement was supposed to be part of their E3 presentation. So we might have a bit of a wait before we hear anything official about this, but it very much seems as if this is a thing and this is happening. Lois Camley, with your newfound love of Mario and everything Mushroom Kingdom, you must have absolutely shit the bed when you heard this. <laughs> I wouldn't go quite that far, but yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this. As you're kind of alluding to there, we both bought a Switch and Mario Odyssey was my first ever proper introduction to like playing Mario. Obviously, I've seen it my whole life, but that was the first one that I had sat and played through from start to finish and really enjoyed it. It's up there as one of my favourite Switch games, as it will be for most people who've played it, I suspect. I, from day one, having started playing Mario Odyssey, have been thinking that getting these old 3D games remastered would be incredible and perfect for the Switch. Switch delivering all of our dreams year after year. Um, <laughs> and I, particularly something about Mario 64. The dream machine. Exactly, the dream machine. Something about Mario 64 coming. That's one of these games that has just been like on the opponent console since we were kids, effectively, right? We yeah, both had yeah, PlayStation, yeah. the original PlayStation, rather than Nintendo 64s. And it's just all. Have you ever played Mario 64 out of interest? Have you ever I've, played I've, Mario 64? Yeah, yeah. I've had like hands-on sticks with it. I've, an old uh, friend at primary school had it. He was the only person I knew that had an N64. Played it for maybe an hour, something like that. And oh, so, really? Well, yeah, well. so nothing much. Nothing much at all. And I've never played any of the other ones. One of my other friends said that Galaxy is his favourite Mario game. Um, I think Galaxy is a lot of people's favourite. Yeah, Galaxy is supposed to be really good. Exactly. Really, really yeah. good. That's the one I'm probably most excited about, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's like there's something there for everyone. It's amazing to be able to jump back in and play this if this all turns out to be true. It does look like it's going to be true. And yeah, and then a brand new Paper Mario and 3D World Deluxe. Like, there's so much going on there. It's going to be like a massive celebration of Mario. And for me, yeah, getting into those remastered 3D games is just going to be so sweet. Nice one, man. That sounds awesome. I must admit, I, as you know, have never really been super into Mario, even Mario Odyssey, which I did like a lot. And it's probably one of my favourite 3D platformers ever. I'm just not really into 3D platformers. Yeah. It's, it's just a rule of thumb. Um, so a lot of this stuff doesn't massively appeal to me. Or that that's not necessarily true. It doesn't appeal to me probably as much as it appeals to you. Um, however, I, I did always like the look of Galaxy. Mario 64 is obviously an absolute classic as well. Um, I know the Paper Mario series has been lauded for a long, long time as well. So if all this stuff comes to Switch, then I don't see any reason why I wouldn't play it. 
quite frankly. So it's very, very cool that it's coming. Hopefully, again, we're, we're all taking this as fact, but hopefully it is coming. Um, it seems to be that Mario 64, Sunshine and Galaxy might come in as like a collection and then the 3D World Deluxe will be kind of sold separately and then obviously the Paper Mario will yeah. be a separate game again. So if I could buy a collection of those three games, like I would be completely down for that. <laughs> Also interesting that Nintendo's had quite a quiet year and maybe they were just building up to this and a criticism of Nintendo at this point in time is that we don't know a lot of games that are coming out just now for them. So it would have been amazing if we'd have got this crescendo at E3 and they'd announced all this for the, for the year ahead. But unfortunately we won't get that because of the situation with E3 being cancelled. But at the same time, this is this is going to be superb if they do announce this and they do announce that maybe in the next uh, six to eight months we're going to get all these awesome Mario games. Make people forget about <laughs> Metroid and uh, the Breath of the Wild sequel for a while anyway. And their terrible lives right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, news item number three. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 Remaster has shadow dropped this week. Actually, yesterday as we were recording this, um, I used the term shadow dropped very, very loosely because there was leaks absolutely all over the place for this game. And it was probably one of the worst kept secrets in video games that this was coming. So this is a remake, obviously, of the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Uh, it is just the campaign. There is no multiplayer and Activision have actually made it quite clear that they have no plans to include a multiplayer at any point, uh, which to me seems like a bit of a miss personally, because although the campaign for Modern Warfare 2 was probably one of the better ones, or certainly one of the better ones that I remember, but it was the, the online multiplayer 100% made that game what it was and why it was so amazing at that time. Uh, it is, however, a timed exclusive for the PS4. It's currently out now, as we're speaking for the PS4, but PC and Xbox will have to wait until April the 30th. And interesting choice, because this campaign for Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 included the very, very controversial, at the time, no Russian mission, which saw you take control of a terrorist, basically, and gun down civilians in an airport, which, yeah, wasn't wasn't brilliant. And they've chose to continue to keep that in the game, which is an, is an interesting decision. I don't necessarily think it's a bad decision, but it's interesting that they've chose to keep it there because I know for a fact that this game is no longer coming out in Russia because of it. Yeah, that's true, yeah. I suspect they knew that they'd get flack if they removed it as well from fans of the original game, right? So, yeah, sort, so, sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? 100%, yeah, I suspect that's the position they were in. Just to reel back quickly to the multiplayer point, it seems like what they're saying is that they kind of want gamers to focus on the multiplayer from the Modern Warfare remaster from the tail end of last year and they've been putting I, I'm speaking out of turn here because I don't know that was all, a remake. all the maps yeah, Modern yeah. Warfare remake sorry remaster, remake yeah. yeah they've been putting the maps from Call of Duty various games into the multiplayer yeah that. so, so, they, the idea, so they right? have classic maps and yeah. in, in the current Call of Duty Modern Warfare that came out at the end of 2019 they're, they are reintroducing uh, classic maps and there I know that there's some already uh, so I think that they're concentrating on updating that game in terms of multiplayer and not introducing multiplayer to Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 remaster, which I kind of get to a certain extent, but I don't know, I just don't know how appealing uh, the Modern Warfare 2 campaign is yeah. to a lot of people without the multiplayer there, because again, it was it was just so much about the multiplayer at that time. It, to me, it just seems like a bit of a miss. Would you not go back and play this campaign then? Is that what you're saying? No, nah, no, nah, probably not. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, honestly, like quite honestly, I probably wouldn't. Although I played uh, the campaign for all the Call of Duties I ever owned, I mean, very few of them actually stuck with me. They're, they're pretty good at the time. I, I don't really think that there's too much to say about them, <laughs> to be completely honest with you. I do think the Modern Warfare 2 uh, was probably one of the better ones, personally. So it's, it's good that they've chose to remake this one. But at the same time, it's not really why the game was as good as good as it was the reason why it was as good as it was was because of the online multiplayer and how at, at the time anyway it was just uh, head and shoulders above the rest you know what's your take on no russian still being in the game then i don't necessarily think it's a bad decision as i as i said i do think that there is ways of doing that scene well i don't think that how it was originally done was done well and i think that it was basically done at the time to generate a bit of controversy around the game i don't know if that was deliberate or whatever but i think that activision certainly leaned into it it's it's not a great scene to be honest with you like apart from anything else and not getting i don't know if anyone's thinking oh you're just a big namby pamby snowflake over there but i mean it's just, it really is just a scene where you take control 
of a Russian terrorists. Doors open in front of you and you gun down a bunch of NPCs that are trying to run away from you. That's just this big, huge mass crowd. There, there's no, it's, it doesn't really add much. Uh, you playing this, I mean, the player could easily have been told or has been shown a cut scene of these terrorists doing it. The fact that you are made to do it as as the player, it doesn't feel good. Like it does, it's, it doesn't, it never really sat very well with me and I don't really think it sat very well with a lot of people. But ultimately, it was in the original game, so I don't have a massive problem with it still being in it. I don't really think that they should have taken it out either, but I think that there was many ways that that scene could have been done well, even if the player did have agency in it. But I don't think that the way it was done originally was very good. So it'd be interesting to see kind of how they update that, or if they update that at all, or if it is just exactly the same thing. Yeah. All right, and news item number four. Epic Games has announced a, quote, developer first publishing partnership with three amazing indie devs. Epic have made this statement on their website. Today, Epic Games is announcing a new multi platform publishing effort with a developer first approach. Gen Design, Play Dead, and Remedy Entertainment are the first partners to announce relationships with Epic Games Publishing. The Epic Games approach to publishing fundamentally changes the developer publisher model and aims to have the most developer friendly terms in the industry so that creators can focus on making great games. Full creative freedom and ownership. Developers retain 100% of all intellectual property and full creative control of their work. Fully funded projects. Epic Games Publishing will cover up to 100% of development costs, from developer salaries to -to go-to-market expenses such as QA, localization, marketing and all publishing costs. 50-50 profit sharing. Developers earn a fair share for their work. Once costs are recouped, developers earn at least 50% of all profits. Tim Sweeney, the founder and CEO of Epic Games, said, We're building the publishing model we always wanted for ourselves when we worked with publishers. And Hector Sanchez, head of Epic Games Publishing, said, Gen Design, Remedy and Play Dead are among the most innovative and talented studios in the industry, with strong visions for their next games. They will have full creative control, while Epic will provide a solid foundation of project funding and services. Additional information, development partners and games will be announced in the coming months. So I think this is very, very cool. And all three of these studios are absolutely awesome. Gen Design is Fumito Ueda's studio. And if you don't know who he is, uh, he is responsible for The Last Guardian and Ico and most importantly, Shadow of the Colossus and is an incredible video game designer. And then Play Dead made Limbo and Inside, both of which were two of our previous play along games and both of which are two of mine and Lewis's favourite indie games ever and then Remedy who made Max Payne and Alan Wake and last year's game of the year for many publications Control I think this is absolutely amazing the devs are getting such an incredibly good deal I love the fact that Epic have been so transparent about what the deal is as well Uh, we don't normally get to hear about this uh, from a lot of publications we don't know what the publishing deal is for say what uh, Insomniac's publishing deal was with PlayStation exclusively for the last Spider-Man game I mean we we never get to see these thins and outs of this but it's it's very interesting that um, Epic have been so transparent and forward about it it's also worth pointing out that Epic haven't bought and do not own any of these studios so all the studios are still independent and the, the, the deal is only for the game's current in development basically for Gen Design and Play Dead and for Remedy they've actually got a two game deal which if you don't know the rumours around Remedy it seems as though there might be an Alan Wake game or two coming quite soon and it's also very important to point out because this is epic um, is that this is a multi-platform deal which means that we can assume that these games will at the very least also be coming to consoles it remains to be seen whether or not on PC they remain as Epic Game Store's exclusives or whether or not they will be available on Steam. So what do you think of this? I think this is fucking brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I can't help but can't help but agree with you there, Mark. It's a really, really incredible deal that Epic are offering. I just want to start actually with what you were saying about how interesting it is that they've been very upfront and public about the terms of that deal because well, what's your take do you do you think this might make a change in the industry it felt very much to me like when they announced the terms that they were giving uh, studios to come onto the epic Games store that's ignited a huge discussion about what steam might have to do in order to keep some relationships there they're now doing this in the publishing arm of what they do do you think it's going to have an impact I hope so. I mean, who who can say really, but I hope so. I mean, this would be great if more 
um, smaller developers, more independent developers were given deals like this and maybe Epic are kind of putting themselves out there, particularly getting these high caliber yet still independent studios on board with these sort of deals. Maybe this is them saying to the world, well, we're here, you know, like if you want to talk about this let's get involved because mm. they have also said that that last line that you read additional information developer and partners and games will be announced in the coming months which means that there there might be more partnerships in the works here you know and i think if more development studios are more financially stable and are more able to dedicate their time to developing the games that they want to develop and less time worrying about fucking money then ultimately everyone's winning you know yeah absolutely and and the fact that they are guaranteeing that developers will retain the rights to all their work as well it's just such a positive move to say you're never gonna yeah. if you cut this deal if you end up walking away from us we're not keeping the games that you created that you invented these characters these worlds you know that you're going to be able to take them on if you are offered a better deal somewhere and and continue your series so it feels to me like a really strong move from epic people still get angry about epic's entry into the the, the PC launcher kind of world where they put out the Epic Game Store. Again, I, I think me and you were both kind of of the mindset back then is we might not understand this fully, but it seems good. And here again, like, this seems good from Epic. There's not a lot to criticise them with here. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bold, good move for me. No, it's, it's great It's great to see such a, as, as they put it, developer first move, because in reality, these are the people who are making the games and yeah it, it seems it seems very very positive indeed and hopefully more developers can get involved or more to the point more publishers can do a similar thing all right finishing off with a couple of shout outs first of all free games lewis free games is the first podcast of the month and that means free games on your xbox games with gold you've got project cars 2 You've got Knights of Pen and Paper Bundle. You've got Fable Anniversary, which is a 360 game, and Toy Box Turbos, which is also a 360 game. And then on PlayStation Plus, you've got Dirt Rally 2.0 and Uncharted 4, A Thief's End. It seems as though Xbox have slightly given up with the games with gold since uh, Xbox Game Pass. You know that? <laughs> All right, shout out number two. Resident Evil 3 Remake reviews are in, currently sitting at an 81 on PS4, an 83 on Xbox One, and a 76 on PC. Now that 76 is pulled down massively by one PC gamer review, which gave it a 53 or something like that. But nonetheless, I, I kind of thought those reviews would be a little higher. I don't know what you were thinking. Yeah, I kind of expected around a 9 as well, you know, overall on all platforms, because it's certainly when we played that demo it felt very similar to Resident Evil 2 remake totally. and, and that's you know that's the kind of scores it was getting back then so I, I don't know like we obviously we haven't played it yet and we'll know more when we get a chance to but yeah strange that it's not quite hit the heights I've seen some reasons for that I did read the PC Gamer article in full can kind of accept some of those criticisms don't accept other ones for various reasons but I think also it comes down to what version what type of Resident Evil that you like you know there's definitely the slow strange stressful version that Resident Evil 2 remake represents or Resident Evil 2 generally this is slightly more action focused as we know from things like the the dodge roll and the fact that your knife can't break this time it's, it's much more action focused and that's just not what some people are after from their Resident Evil game so maybe that's the impact I don't know what's, what's your take on that yeah to me honestly I just think it could be down to the fact that the, the source material simply isn't as good this time around you know what I mean I think at the time Resident Evil 3 was considered not as good as Resident Evil 2 although I totally fine game in itself mm. but also the the main criticism that i've heard that i was a wee bit concerned about is that maybe um nemesis isn't used the best they could be yeah doesn't have maybe the impact that you should be in certain times or yeah maybe it isn't as much of a threat throughout the game as you might have otherwise thought they it would be all right shout out number three bleeding edge reviews are also in now full disclosure we should have done this last week, but last week's episode was an absolute monster. So now we're covering it this week. <laughs> <laughs> quite quite frankly, it is not reviewed well. I'm currently sitting at a 69 on Xbox One and a 63 on PC. By all accounts, it seems like a relatively fun game, but it is pretty surface level. It's wanting in a lot of content, it seems, and it gets a bit samey a bit quickly and gets a little bit grindy as well. So a bit of a swing and a miss here for Ninja Theory on their first Xbox exclusive. I'd be very interested to know whether they went to Xbox with this game or whether 
Xbox said to them, oh, we want a game like this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'd be very interested to know that. But ultimately, I think Ninja Theory's next one, which is going to be Hellblade 2, is going to be very popular and very good. But unfortunately, this one, not so much, perhaps. But if it looks like your thing, it's a kind of 3D brawler, melee-focused game. If, if it takes your fancy, have a look. But yeah, the review's not so hot. All right, and shout out number four. Final Fantasy VII Remake will be released early in Europe and Australia. Square Enix made this statement on Twitter. The Final Fantasy VII Remake team have worked extremely hard to make this game and we are incredibly proud of what you are about to play. Our biggest motivator during the development was that so many of you were willing us on and we felt your enthusiasm and passion every step of the way. We had some hard decisions to make during the final few weeks before launch due to disruption to distribution channels caused by the spread of the COVID-19 virus. These unique circumstances have made it very difficult to align timing of our global shipping. Our highest priority is that all of you, including those who live in countries currently facing the biggest disruption, can play the game at launch. So we made the decision to ship the game far earlier than usual to Europe and Australia. As a result, there is a greater chance that some of you in these regions will now get a copy of the game prior to the worldwide release date of April 10th. For other Western regions, including the Americas, copies will be shipped this week and we feel optimistic that most of you will receive the game for launch day. However, due to the challenging situation, we cannot provide delivery dates for each country and each retailer. We really want all of you looking forward to Final Fantasy VII Remake to play the game on April 10th and experience everything we've been working on together. To everyone, we would like to ask one big favour. If you get the game early, please think of others and don't spoil it for them. We know there are potential spoilers that have been out there for over two two decades as the original Final Fantasy VII was released in 1997, but Final Fantasy VII Remake is a new game that still has many surprises for everyone. All our fans and players deserve to experience the game for themselves, and we ask for the support of our dedicated community around the world to ensure that. On behalf of the entire development team and everyone around the world that has worked on getting Final Fantasy VII Remake to, to you all, thanks again for your support, and most importantly, please stay safe. Yeah, I mean, fair play. I actually meant to mention when we were talking about Resident Evil 3 as well that they were saying that uh, there could be problems with the distribution of that game as well. Um, Very similar to the Final Fantasy 7 comments that were made last week. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, fair enough. It's it's good that they're going out their way, even getting the game to people early to make sure that as many people get their game by launch date as possible. So they're, they're going the extra mile here and I admire that. I think that's good. What I would say, though, on the subject of spoilers is don't go and look up that uh, statement on Twitter because the first comment is a massive spoiler. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, well, we'll share it on the show notes of players com, but maybe don't click on it so that you don't see anything more than that. <laughs> All right, and shout out number five. The original Nier game is getting a remaster, and Mark was very excited about it. Officially called Nier Replicant version 1.22474487139, which is a very Yoko Taro name to give something, um, it is a remaster of the game Nier Replicant, which was actually a Japan-only PS3 release of the game. The Western release of the Nier game was called Nier Gestalt and was notably different. And in actual fact, you played as a father-daughter team in the Western release and you played as a brother-sister team in the Japanese release. And you were, I think you played as like basically a young-ish kid in the Japanese release and you played as like a fully grown man in the Western release. So the games the games are were quite different. So most people in the West would definitely not have played this game, which is quite interesting in itself. If anyone is interested in the lineage of Nier, I found an incredible video that basically explained it and how mad Yoko Taro is. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes in players2.com. I suppose the big takeaway from this is that Platinum Games will not be involved in this game. So Platinum Games made Nier Automata, which was absolutely amazing and was one of my favourite games of the last five years original Nier played quite differently to that um, but it was still definitely a cult classic and a lot of people love, love, loved it and it was something that I've meant to look into playing um, since I played Nier Automata and loved that so much. Um, they also announced a mobile game called Nier Reincarnation was coming out for Android and iOS and that Nier Automata, I can't remember what it was, the, the Game of the Year edition or, or their definitive edition um, is coming to Xbox Games Pass tomorrow as we record this. So if you've got your Xbox Games Pass, do yourself a favour and go and get Nier Automata because it is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah, one of your favourite games ever, um, or certainly of the last few years, you were saying, the fact that Platinum aren't involved in this remake, what's your take on that? Are you, do you think you'll pick it up still? I mean, Platinum weren't involved in the game in the first place, so I'm okay with it. I, I know for a fact that the game didn't play the way that Nier Automata played anyway, which yeah. does play sort of like a Platinum <laughs> game. 
whereas this doesn't. So I, I'm not really that bothered about it at all. It was just, for me, a very good excuse to go and play that game, you know, that I just wanted to go and play anyway. So for me, this is totally thumbs up. Absolutely amazing. Cannot wait to hear when it comes out. It will definitely begin, but... Nice. All right, Lewis, I think it's time for a beer, and we will be back with Topic of the Week. And we are back with Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is our play-along with Sam Barlow's Her Story. It is indeed, Mark. Yeah, this is one of my most anticipated games that we've done for the play along section this is a game that I've been meaning to play for years now actually um, and finally uh, with the play along had the impetus to go and actually get on with it so yeah this is Sam Barlow's first solo game Sam Barlow if you've heard of him at all it's probably because of her story and the sort of spiritual successor to that Telling Lies which came out just last year but he also previous to that was the lead designer on two Silent Hill games uh, Silent Hill Origins and Shattered Memories um, so he's got a bit of clout in the industry but decided I think just to get out of the traditional developer publisher system and go independent so that he could make his own very story driven games I think that's been his absolute driving force in what he's been trying to do with his video games and yeah absolutely. her story was it the first like one through in this one yeah <laughs> absolutely does yeah so we are going to talk about the game it is obviously going to be very spoiler centric because it is a story driven game there's not that much more to it but yeah essentially her story opens up and you are playing as someone looking at a desktop computer um, with a kind of police database of interview clips which basically show a series of interviews with a woman named Hannah Smith in relation to the disappearance and latterly you find out the murder or the death at least suspicious death of her husband Simon and from there you know this is at the core of what the game is and how it operates maybe debatable how much of a game this is we've talked about this a lot recently about interactive experiences versus gaming essentially your role as the player is just to effectively Google words on the platform that you're given within this game on the database and those words are keywords that are transcriptions from the videos and so you're being served back the clips that relate to those words so it pretty much gives you the first one I think right which is murder it's a prompt yeah, so, so, so the game starts showing this old CTR yeah monitor. it's like an old Windows uh, 98 thing or something it's yeah, crazy exactly. yeah exactly a proper, a proper <laughs> 90s computer yeah Again, you're you're basically just presented with a search engine. I mean, that's yep. basically all it is. It's supposed to be like a police search engine. Yep. And the word already in the search when the game starts is murder, which sets the tone, I would say, <laughs> for, for, for the rest of it. So you, all you do from there is you click enter on murder, as I'm sure everyone probably does when they first start the game. And a series of video clips comes up, which is one side of an interview, basically, yep. which is the interview, as you said, of uh, Hannah Smith. And it's her responding to questions that you can't hear from a police detective, basically. Exactly, yeah. And through that, you unravel this insane story of Hannah and what happened to her husband Simon um, who was who had quotes disappeared but in actual fact it turned out had been killed the way that this is presented to you is just through the search engine so you actually have access to the entire story everything that you could possibly see in this game is accessible to you from minute one you know and in actual fact if you search the name of the game if you search her story you will find the ending immediately is that is are we kind of i don't, I don't know if very, you know that i didn't like realize you, you, that, that well, was, you find out at least yeah. what what happened to simon immediately yeah and in actual fact like even in my playthrough of the game i found out what happened to simon very early on none of that really mattered because it was all to do with oh well how do we get from point a to point b to point c you know what i mean it was mm. connecting the dots was the interesting part it wasn't the fact you knew the beginning the middle and the end it was to do with how did you get from the beginning to the middle and then how, how did you get from the middle to the end you know yeah absolutely I mean even from the beginning you're not entirely certain which murder you're trying to solve because one of the things that I found very early on just through the terms I was searching was information about the death of Hannah's parents which came across to me as very suspicious right from that moment you're kind of trying to work out what it is that you're even being asked to do really within the game and then yeah as you say, I also stumbled across some of the key details. I don't think the actual the, the clip that you're talking about where if you if you search her story, you get that right away. I don't think I got that clip super early, but I got stuff very early on where I was like, okay, I think I basically know how this has panned out. But then it's, it's as you say, it's then up to you to try and find all the connecting pieces and put the story from interview one all the way through to the final interview and understand what is going on, what has happened, who is talking to you at certain points, what they're talking about. 
that's where the game really starts to open up. So let's dive into that, Mark. Let's talk about some of the strange things that come up during these interviews. Well, it should, well, because this is all an interview, I just wanted to say one thing on, on Sam Barlow and his process. Apparently he had watched hundreds of hours of police interviews just to get a feel for how this process works and the kinds of things that people would say in police interviews, including like high profile cases in America. Like he would, he would sit down and read through the transcripts and then he himself would effectively play her story with the transcripts Ah. and find key words and see if he could deduce what was happening in this case just by looking at these key words and sentences that people were saying and he found that he could and then he found that he could then turn this into a game which i I just think it's a very i just think it's a very fascinating creative process definitely yeah In the game itself, I think the story that is being told, and it's called Her Story, and this game is 100% story. The game is essentially only narrative. You slowly go through and you immediately think that this person is under suspicion of murdering her husband. I mean, that I think is clear from minute one. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. However, as you continue to go, it suddenly gets very, very weird very quickly. And you find clips of her seemingly speaking about herself in the third person. And then you continue to watch further. And then they're referring to her and Simon. And very as if she's entirely removed from the situation. And long story short, and this is this is the most spoilery of spoilers. But as it turns out, is that this is essentially two women that are being interviewed. It is twins. And they are pretending to be one person during these interviews but for me anyway it's less about what that story actually was and the story in itself was actually very interesting a bit bit wild and mad at times Mm. but it was just how that story was told to you through this medium of these these tiny little clips and this this way that you search through them because I, I honestly think that that is one of the most creative ways I've seen storytelling being done in a video game mm-hmm. ever it was it was just fascinating he obviously led you down quite specific paths and he presented you with a certain set of words in the transcripts of these interviews so the way it worked is that when the interviewee Hannah spoke you saw subtitles at the bottom and if you searched well most of those words they would come up in a search and if you got one interview where she said mentioned Glasgow which actually did happen in the game which I thought yeah, was really yeah. really weird um, <laughs> then you were like oh okay I'll search Glasgow and then see what she done in Glasgow and then there's another three interviews of where she mentioned the word Glasgow and then in one of those interviews she mentions oh and then I went to a hospital and then you would type in hospital and then you find out why she was in the hospital and what happened around the hospital but then that might lead you down an entirely different road entirely where she's just mentioned the word hospital and something completely different in some in some situation that happened in her childhood or whatever that yeah. isn't in the game but uh, that is the sort of process that you go through and finding this and finding out about this story so uh, the whole story was just given to you and it was up to you to find it you know I mean it was it, it was just great it, I, I really I was actually, in a lot of ways, slightly sceptical about whether or not I was going to like this. Mm. And I was absolutely taken in by the story, which in itself is very interesting. Just the completionist in me, I suppose. Like, So I went through (laughs) and systematically, at the end of the game, went back and listened to every single clip. So I think there's like 200 and something in it. And so these these range from like three seconds to like maybe about a minute. Like They're they're not very long. They're not not long clips. But I went back and listened to every single clip in that thing because I was just fascinated. I was like, no, I need to hear this whole story. It was great. It really drew me in. And the fact that you had to be the detective, you had to be inquisitive about what was happening. It felt as if you were really finding your own story in there yep. as well, somehow. Um, even even though there is technically only one story, but it somehow felt as if you really were that person sitting in front of the computer, like finding this out on their own terms, sort of thing. Definitely, it was, it was very, it's very, it's very interesting. I, I think that that's the key to it all. I, I was quite nervous that you weren't going to enjoy it. I started playing it just before you did, and had concerns about about players generally i can see why people wouldn't enjoy this but what you just said there that aspect of feel genuinely feeling like a detective and i think that was one of sam barlow's kind of main ambitions with the game um was, it, it really it was yeah, yeah it was yeah. to make something that didn't feel you know some of the flaws that are in other detective games you think to like the detective systems and like the batman games say where it's basically just hold a button and you'll see everything you need to see and you'll follow it along this is actually sat there watching clips putting together a narrative deciding what's important often going down blind corridors or like you said there like you find one aspect of the story and you begin to find it interesting so you keep searching for words around that and you basically then find out everything about that and you realize ah, that's actually not that important to the to the overall story but it's a really interesting part of hannah's you know story of what happened in her life and so because of that like that idea of going around piecing everything together creating your own stories as you say like as i mentioned before like i got really caught up in the idea that something really dodgy had happened with the parents 
there's several other characters and several other little mysteries like that all the way through it where you're kind of like well you know what's actually going on here what who else is involved in all this or, or whatever it, it might be and that's kind of I wanted to dive in there with like what might actually be going on so at the end of the game it seems to be revealed to you that in fact the other twin the not Hannah twin who's referred to as Eve during the game is pregnant and that Hannah has committed the murder and that she has been stepping into her place now there's a lot of suggestion online and certainly it was one of my theories and one of the things I kept searching while playing the game was that this was some sort of split personality or dissociative personality that disorder is going absolutely on. absolutely what I thought as well that is absolutely what I thought as well throughout the whole thing until I'd noticed a few different bits and pieces here and there but that is 100% what I thought for the vast majority of the game I'll let you continue well that, that's it I mean I don't I don't feel the need to go too deeply into that because I think it's there I think it's deliberately there from Sam Barlow I don't think it's completely discredited there's some parts of evidence that are within it that I think probably disproves it there's a part of me that wonders whether those are more like mistakes that actually that is a suggestion because there's so much refer- referred to around fairy tales and stories I mean just the phrase her story uh, it kind of reverberates throughout the whole game and there's a sense of like how much of this is fiction and even if we take it to be true that there there were two twins and somehow no one ever noticed but there were two twins and this is what happened we're still essentially told that by one of those two twins and we sort of have to make a decision based on that so it's it's in the final interview where I certainly assumed that Eve is speaking to us and she tells you that Hannah did it and here are the reasons why Hannah did it but that's one person's viewpoint on that situation we basically never know if your understanding of that story is accurate or not you just have to kind of go along with it i think that there are things that show that it's supposed to be two people for example i think one of them has a tattoo well Mm -hmm. one of them does have a tattoo eve has a tattoo yeah but i'm not entirely sure that you ever see hannah's arm where the, the tattoo is on eve bare there's one bit where she spills a cup of tea or something on herself and takes her shirt off and i think you see then that it isn't there but it looks oh, is that? totally fake, that tattoo. And I wondered if it was, uh, you know, it crossed my mind that that could just be a, a transfer, you know, a, a non-permanent oh, right, tattoo, right. which is, you know, probably reading too much into it. But yeah, there was also a situation as well where in one of the interviews, Hannah has a has a, like a black eye. Mm-hmm. But on the interview just after that, which was only uh, supposed to be like a matter of days, Eve doesn't have a black eye. And then when the interviewer mentioned it, she touches the wrong side of her face yeah. as well. Like that, that that was the other one and also the, but the main bit is that the, the reason why Glasgow was involved is that during the murder Hannah quotes was supposed to be in Glasgow but in actual fact Eve drove to Glasgow while Hannah was there killing Simon that was the kind of plot but, but again you are totally right and you only hear one side of that and could this be a situation where in actual fact this is like mental illness because as you say like fairy tales comes up a lot and th- this um duality as well and using in mirrors comes up a lot and looking through windows and whatever it's it's all it, it all it all implies a sort of duality yeah but at the same time it also implies a reflection so it you you don't know it yeah with with absolute certainty certainly but that that was my interpretation of it by the end is that this was literally two people yeah. but I, I could i certainly for long long periods of the game felt otherwise yeah, so totally, i yeah. completely understand where you're coming from i mean i, I don't get me wrong I, I basically agree with you i think it probably is supposed to be two people but the the fact that that is such a prevalent possibility for so long in the game and it does inform a lot of how you go about trying to discover the truth i just i thought that was really interesting that it would play on that you know can you even trust you know in a game generally speaking we have to trust what we're told you don't normally get unreliable narrators in games the way that you do no, in no, you cinema don't. or literature or whatever and to have it here and to be watching the whole thing thinking Literally everything she could be saying here could be nonsense. I have, I just have no way of telling. Yeah, no, there's absolutely there's no way of telling. And as well, like you even only get like this one side constantly yeah. of the of the conversation. Like you you don't hear anyone's voice apart from Hannah and Eve's. Yeah, they, they are the only two people that say any words in the whole game. Yeah, I, I I thought it was a truly remarkable way of telling a story. Again, the story in itself is quite interesting, and we won't delve into the, yeah. the nitty gritty details of that, obviously. And, and I highly recommend that anyone go and play the game because it is a truly fascinating experience. Or I certainly thought so anyway yeah and i just thought i just thought it was very very expertly done and very creative way of telling a story in a game and the execution of that was just very very good by sam barlow and just the way that he nudges you in certain directions as well it's, sometimes it's more blatant than others but the way that he's clearly nudging you down certain paths so that he's still 
weaving the story that he wants to tell you in the way that he wants to tell you it but it feels very much as if you are discovering it yourself and although we you may discover things in maybe a slightly different order the path that you follow will generally be at least in broad strokes the same mm-hmm. But nonetheless, just not taking your hand through it, you know what I mean? Just just giving you that freedom to discover it at your whim. It was, was a real masterstroke, I thought. I, I mean, it really does translate very, very well into a game. And I know we were talking about games and like, is this a game or is this like an interactive experience? And this came up as well with Kentucky Route Zero. In a lot of ways, this sort of is an interactive experience, I would say. But it was absolutely fantastic, nonetheless. Yeah, absolutely great. I totally agree with that. And the, yeah, it's an interactive experience, but also the fact that it has like a puzzle element element to it you're constantly trying to put these pieces together and work out what's going on that that makes it more of a game for me as well and I think as well that we should just say something about the the final there's a little kind of final twist even about how you how you even end the game it doesn't behave like a normal game there is no kind of like congratulations you've solved it it's just kind of ebbs out you've got to just leave your computer in my case and think about what it was you discovered I just I really loved that subtle way that the story was told and the way that it didn't try and say like here's what actually happened here's your 100% completion graphic to tell you what all happened so really kind of sensitive subtle storytelling from Sam Barlow which I, it makes me so excited to go and play Telling Lies now as well just to see yeah. what else that this formula can kind of carry you know yeah, Telling Lies of course the spiritual successor to her story which will be our play along game for next month which I am very very excited to play now as well I've unfortunately missed that sale that you told me about Lewis so I will have to pay full price <laughs> <laughs> that's okay and on that list I'd like to remind everyone that you can find players too on all the social media that's Facebook Twitter YouTube Instagram the lot you can also find our written content over at players com. that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S T-O-O dot com and if you could take five seconds to give us five stars wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, wherever, it all helps for the exposure of the show. If you could give us five stars, we would really, really, really appreciate that. We can't say that enough. And if you could leave us a little review as well, let us know and we'll shout you out on social media. Again, all of this just helps us out so much and it does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And if you've already done that for us, just thank you so, so much. You're an absolute legend to us. As we've just said, our play along game for this month will be Telling Lies, which is the spiritual successor to her story. I think this is going to be really, really fascinating to uh, play both of these games back to back, particularly with how much I loved her story. So we'll, we'll see how we'll see how that pans out. I know that you're feeling the same. Yeah, I couldn't be more excited to play it. I think it's going to be super interesting when we have the discussion at the on the first show of May to see how the two games come together as well. So obviously we'll do our discussion on Telling Lies, but I'm sure there'll be a bit of reflection back again on her story. So still time to play them both if you haven't yet and get involved with that definitely definitely and we never even mentioned that her story was actually a, a relatively short experience i mean i i got through it in maybe like three or four hours yeah i would say basically like, yeah. quite quite comfortably and that was going through and watching every single video <laughs> as well you know so you can definitely get through it faster than me as well i would really recommend that anyone anyone play it if this sounds in any way interesting to you all right and i think we'll leave it at that ladies and gentlemen we will see you next week thanks 